SMT Nation, we back. We've got an article from Mike Dano, Light Reading. This article that we're going to look at today, I'll definitely link it in the description. Uh, but the reason I wanted to do a highlight on this is I think it does a really good job of catching pretty much most of what's going on with cellular network building for 5G. T-Mobile, AT&T, and Verizon doing things a little differently. For the most part, a lot of things are the same. The principles to networking when it comes to mobile networks the principles don't really change. You know, the, you can make a couple of decisions here and there, uh, but for the most part, the principles to good networking are consistent across the board, regardless of the carrier and whatever the nuances are. All right, so let's see if the uh, the writer hits everything on the spot, covers everything, or let's see if we find something that kind of was overlooked. All right, so starting first, uh, Verizon hopes to cover around 175 million people with its mid-band 5G by the end of the year. AT&T hopes to hit the 100 million mark, and T-Mobile's looking to hit 260 million people by the end of the year. All right, so how do the carriers different differentiate themselves here is T-Mobile essentially had a two-year head start beyond their competition due to the T-Mobile and Sprint merger, essentially a 5G stimulus package, right? They get the, the 2.5 gigahertz, from Sprint, and then they start building. You know, that was just about two and a half years ago or whatever. Uh, so it gives them a bit of a boost in that respect. Meanwhile, AT&T and Verizon had to wait until, you know, the C-band auction, which they've done a pretty nice job of building since they've been allowed to uh, and actually deploy the spectrum. So that that's kind of why you see that discrepancy between the number of people covered. All right, moving on here. It says, uh, you know, there is a difference between spectrum depth. This is 100% fact. All right. So if you take, for example, T-Mobile, which has somewhere in the area of like 140, 160 megahertz of the 2.5 gigahertz spectrum, AT&T has 40 megahertz of C-band, the 3.7. They also have 40 megahertz of 3.45. Not all phones are going to be able to connect to both of those frequencies uh, within the spectrum band for N77. Uh, some phones will only be able to connect to half of that or part of that. And then, of course, uh, Verizon's got 60 megahertz of C-band. Currently, some markets have 100 as they've early cleared additional spectrum. Uh, next year, both Verizon and AT&T will have deeper C-band holdings that they can use. All right, so... Some of it's kind of fluid, but for the most part, T-Mobile's got the most uh, to deploy currently. Now, when it comes to branding, all right, they all do it a little differently. Verizon is using the 5G UW. All right, you guys have heard of 5G Ultra Wideband. That refers to their millimeter wave and their C-band build. And then AT&T has 5GE, which is essentially just advanced LTE. And then you have 5G Plus, which is their C-band and millimeter wave. And then you have uh, the regular 5G, which is either their dedicated low band, which performs a lot like LTE, or it's their DSS, which could be like band two, which is also shared spectrum with LTE. And then T-Mobile does the 5G UC to designate its millimeter wave, which it doesn't really do much of. And then um, also the, the most important part, which is their N41, their uh, 2.5 gigahertz. And then they have regular 5G, which is just their low band 5G, all right, the 600 megahertz. Okay, so that that's pretty much this, right? Now, when it comes to like radio vendors, Verizon is using Samsung and Ericsson. They don't really do anything with Nokia outside of previously using some millimeter wave at launch. They've kind of moved away from that and they're replacing it with Samsung. Uh, AT&T's got technically deals with all three although I have not seen or heard of them actually deploying the Samsung gear. Uh, so mostly Nokia and Ericsson, and T-Mobile is pretty much the same, right? Nokia and Ericsson all the way. I don't know about them using anything from Samsung. Anyways, this is why I said a lot of the instances where the differentiation between the carriers, it's, it's not really all that different. They use essentially mostly the same vendors in whatever combination, and uh, it's really just about spectrum depth. How much spectrum do they have? and uh, what frequencies they're using, and and they build to that. All right, now um, where things get a little bit interesting is fiber. 
Verizon is probably going to be somewhere around the 50% mark, meaning they're going to own their own fiber to 50% of their cell sites. Verizon has 64,000 macros across the country, according to this article. I hear it's more, but I, I don't know. How do I confirm that? So we'll just go with this. Uh, 30,000 small cells. I'm not sure if this actually, I don't think it does. This doesn't indicate the millimeter wave nodes. Because millimeter wave nodes, I think they're approaching like 35,000 of those at least. Uh, they're doing like 14 to 70, 17,000 millimeter wave nodes annually in terms of that network build. And they've been at that for like two or three years. So I don't know about these numbers. Um, AT&T also a big time owner of the fiber that it runs to its tower sites. Uh, they want to reach 30 million locations by 2025. This provides them with owner economics, allows them to put major capacity to the tower sites. This is going to be most important as the spectrum depth for the channels increases. As they get more and more spectrum, they need higher capacity fiber. They need more of those 10, 25, 50 gig circuits uh, that are run to these sites, especially in places that it's millimeter wave, right? That's going to be the demanding one. You know, mid band, you can run a one gig circuit, survive on that. You know, you can push it to get, you know, seven, 800 megabits per second. Uh, to create capacity, but in some places that's not enough. You got to run a 10 gig circuit, and um, you know you really got to push it to get the multi gigs to support real real capacity, especially millimeter wave. Right? Um, T-Mobile doesn't own its fiber; they end up leasing it, and of of course that costs them more. They they do like to downplay this and say that it's cheaper for them. I don't I don't whatever. Um, but anyways, uh, VRAN and CRAN. I'm not sure how much we want to get into this only because it's a little bit of forward looking. Uh, but I know that with Samsung, Verizon does have a lot of VRAN sites. I know that they're up to about 8,000 cell sites. We reported this on a previous video. I think all the carriers eventually are going to end up moving there quite soon. How much of the vendors, you know, have a prominent build for each carrier kind of depends. Like whenever Nokia decides they want to you know, enable this or, or turn on this feature or whatever Ericsson does, you know, those things can be activated. And of course it runs through a dedicated 5G core. When that happens for these carriers, we'll see more of these things getting updated. Uh, so this is more future looking, but we have heard of each carrier kind of orchestrating their own, you know, uh, build to that. Uh, in terms of phones, each of the carriers seems to be around 50 to 60% adoption rate of 5g phones this is important right you got to convince your customers that they buy a five to buy a 5g phone and connect to these wider channels and these faster networks so phones from like i'd say probably starting two years ago are 5g compatible say for example like t-mobile customers having an n600 phone the low band 5g having an n you know 2500 the n41 5g you see having that type of phone is important for capacity uh, and, and they're selling those phones and giving those phones away, you know, for free. AT&T, they sell a ton of iPhones. So getting an iPhone 12, 13, or even the 14 makes the most sense. Uh, Galaxies, you know, starting with the S21 version, right? They've got the modems, they've got the chips, they've got the hardware. Uh, they've got the, uh, the modems that can do the things that they're, all these tower upgrades can do. All right. So they're, they're doing a nice job of that. Send on 5G, we're going to kind of wait. Uh, I don't really want to offer too much commentary here because, again, this is kind of like the ORAN, VRAN situation. Uh, it looks like T-Mobile is the furthest along with SA 5G. And then I think Verizon and AT&T are kind of hand-in-hand, like probably going to see them introducing this uh, SA 5G core next year. Or may maybe, who knows, maybe in the next few months. We'll see. Uh, there has been chatter of, you know... <laughs> of uh, AT&T doing something soon and, and Verizon as well. But uh, T-Mobile does seem to kind of have already experimented with voice over NR and standalone 5G networking uh, with like N41 and such. But so that kind of puts you there. But there's one thing that's missing here, folks. Unbelievable. I can't believe they didn't mention this. And uh, that is cell density. And that is just sheer tower sites. The reason I want to talk about this is because one of the things that I've noticed in my market, and this is not a national networking question. I can only speak to the market I live in, right? And the, some of the ones that I frequent 
in Ohio, for example, is cell density matters. Some networks, and I don't need to name them specifically here because a lot of people will construe it and say that I'm poo-pooing one network or the other, and it's their favorite network, and then they feel offended, and it's like I kicked their dog or something, uh, which is weird and unusual that they want to defend their favorite carrier, but whatever. I just want to say that to not mention cell density, to not mention tighter network grids as being important for 5G, it's kind of a disservice to the customer. Oftentimes, the most important thing when it comes to you enjoying cellular networking and having a good, solid connection and dependable connection has to do with how close the cell tower sites are to one another. The carrier that can give you the tightest cell tower grid, the most cell sites within a given amount of space, a dense network is going to give you the best tower handoffs from cell site to cell site, is going to probably offer you the best uplink experience. And is probably going to offer you the best latency experience because there won't be any congestion because the cells will be split up between people to where it can kind of offer balance loading, you know. So instead of having 10,000 people on one tower, right, imagine having three towers and you split those cells between all those users. It would change the experience in a big way. So in my particular market, the carrier that offers the densest network is Verizon a collection of macro cells, basically every mile, and then they often supplement with additional small cells in places where they either may not have a macro site every mile, maybe it's every two miles for a certain place, they can supplement it with a small cell in between to keep the connection very strong and not bottoming out and having gaps in coverage. Also, the capacity offloading onto those small cells allows them to create capacity-based sites that are location-specific. So say there's like a shopping center or something like that. It allows for a more pleasurable experience, even especially uplink with like video calls and, um, you know, and any type of uh, live streaming or, or uploading videos, you need to uplink. The two carriers that struggle the most with uplink in my market are T-Mobile and AT&T. They don't have trouble with, with downlink. None of the carriers have trouble with downlink. They have plenty of downlink. The trouble happens in the uplink, and I think for 5G use cases and the things we want to do, becoming more mobile and relying on mobility, the uplink cannot be overlooked. It is rather annoying when I'm trying to live stream, and I can't because there's one megabit per second or less available on the site. I have run many cell speed tests, mobile network speed tests, where I'm getting 400 megabits down and one megabit up. That can't be happening in a future of 5G networking. And none of that was discussed in this video, in this article. So unfortunately, that was the cell site density is a really important factor. Uh, I will tell you guys that there is a carrier here in Cleveland, doesn't need to be named, that has been decommissioning small cells. And it has drastically changed the uplink experience in those areas. So where they used to have only 100 megabits downlink, but they had 20 megabits uplink has gone to four or 500 megabits downlink and one megabit uplink. They have traded downlink for, or I should say they have traded uplink for downlink just for the sake of downlink capacity. Unfortunately, it's a, that's a flawed approach. Cell density is important. Cell density matters. And they didn't bring it up here. All right. To truly do a solid 5g networking, it cannot be macro based. There must be CRAN. There must be small cells, and it is not mentioned here. So in my opinion, this article covered 90% of what needs to be discussed in 5G, but it's missing something really important, and that's cell density. Small cells, CRAN, millimeter wave nodes for capacity, those things were overlooked here. I just had to highlight this. So I do like this article for the beginner to kind of know where all the carriers stand. Uh, but you cannot overlook cell density. It's a crucial factor. Let me know what you guys think of this article and everything here uh, that's mentioned. Let me know what you think of my take and what I think was overlooked. Love to hear what you guys have to say on this. You are the voice of the people, the SMT Nation. Let your voice be heard. Like, share, subscribe for more. Turn on the bell notification icon to never miss an upload. Links in the description for my Twitter, my Gmail address for all business inquiries, and my Patreon. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one. Peace.